Hare Krishna Guru Prabhu, welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Hare Krishna, always good to be here with you, Chaitanya Charanji. Yes, bro, it's such a joy to have you. you know, we discuss so many different topics, but I think one of the topics we, we connect on the most is the Gita and the mm-hmm. various, various uh, dimensions of the Gita. So uh, today I thought that we could discuss on uh, two related themes centered on the Gita. No, across the world, especially you could say in the postmodern youth, there is a tendency to identify oneself as spiritual but not religious. Hmm? That's, yes. there's, a, there's an individual trend like that because people say don't want to be affiliated with a particular religion or a particular, especially religious institution. And there is also the tendency, we could say at a governmental level, the governments are secular. So they don't want to affiliate with the religion. Right. So sometimes devotees position the Gita as a spiritual book, but not a religious book. Mm-hmm. So in one sense, when we use the word, when people use the word religion with its negative connotations that they have, that is, we could say that identification is understandable. There is also the concern that mm-hmm. in, in India, there are some, uh, some state governments, Gujarat and Karnataka, they are planning to teach the Gita and uh, teach the Gita officially in the school syllabus. In the Now, there is some opposition to that. The Gita is a religious book and people say it is not a religious book, but actually saying it is a not religious book is also a very strong statement. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get into the politics of this situation, but that was the context in which I thought we could have this discussion of is the Gita a spiritual book or a religious book? So, yeah. Would you like to start with uh, maybe your understanding of these two terms or however you would like to start? Yes. You know, um, the word religion, perhaps we could just start with the word religion. This is not an easy term to understand, negotiate, and um each human that uses the word religion has some preconception, some prior experience of what it is, what it is not, uh, positively, negatively, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the word religion itself has its derivations from the Latin, religare, which means to again connect. So in the very word, in the very morphology of the word is a key to understanding what essentially religion is, Hmm. which is we've become disconnected from reality. We've we've become disconnected from ourselves. We've been disconnected to the divine. So religion is about to reconnect, religare, to reconnect. So at the simplest level, Chaitanya Charanji, religion is something quite universal. Mm. We find ourselves in the conditioned, you know, existence of our lives. And we're trying to find something higher, more real, more essential, more transcendental. Mm -hmm. Human beings are those is the one species that really seeks something greater than themselves. Mm, Beautiful. I've never seen a bunch of chipmunks get together and say, let's try to be more than just chipmunks. Mm, Beautiful. Uh, Chipmunks don't say that. Chipmunks are being chipmunks. Eagles are being eagles. Seals are being seals. Lions are being lions. Humans... No, humans want to be more human at the very least, and even more even than that. They love something transcendent. They love to reach other worlds, whether it be science fiction or whether it be, you know, science, you know, trying to go to other planets, uh, you know, the Olympics, trying to, you know, beat the last, you know, achievement in the 100-yard dash. We're always trying to do more. 
uh, I could say trying to go beyond what is normal, whether it be exactly in the material domain or in the non-material domain. In one sense, the longing is the same. Exactly. Hmm. At least the it's source this, of the longing is the same. Yeah. Exactly. It's this desire to go beyond. It's the desire for levity, you know. Beautiful levity, um, nice word, yeah. Levity, you know, just to. It's it's built into the human spirit, Chaitanya Charanji, mm. and that's why the human birth is a blessed birth because that's where one can actually be elevated to a state of liberation and eternality. So, in one sense, if I'm not mistaken, the way you are explaining religion. is actually not much different from the way most people conceive spirituality right if you say this is spirit, my point spirit longs for something bigger then it's so we could say maybe that spirituality is uh, and religion at least in terms of their you could essential purpose are the same but the way they are understood the way they are maybe demonstrated in the world they may be different yes yeah this one yeah the, yeah go yeah go ahead this one thought i had here you know, when mm -hmm. i study language in english for example there is always this tension between uh, the descriptive and the prescriptive dimensions of vocabulary that is this yes. what a, is a word this is what it is supposed to mean uh, but this is how people use it so quite often uh, yes. the meanings of words change over time because people use it in a different sense from what is in the dictionary and then that's eventually right. you could say the descriptive dimension quite often wins over that's how <laughs> yeah. language yeah. evolves yeah. so yeah. if i understand right presently when you are using the word religion you we could say you are using it a little bit on a prescriptive sense that this is what religion yes. was meant to mean yes essentially yes yes so so is to continue this theme even in einstein's quotes he uses the word religion quite often you know the religious urge can be fulfilled when we see the harmony within the universe or, or things like that so the negative connotation yes. of the word religion seems to be a relatively recent phenomenon maybe last 50 60 years or something like that yeah. is that true yeah i mean uh, uh, i mean look Uh, what we've got out there right now in the world are, are people saying either i am very religious i'm devout hmm. or some people say i'm not religious at all but i'm very spiritual and then the third category is i'm neither religious nor am i spiritual Okay. Now the SBNR, the SBNR, spiritual but not religious. This came out in a book by Robert Fuller in two thousand one. I've read that book. Yes, it's quite a good analysis. <laughs> right, spiritual but not religious. So it that's where this SBNR comes from. Although it's been a trend of people seeking the spiritual to avoid. the impersonalism of the institutionalization of religion um it's it's a reaction to people personally feeling neglected by an institution that promotes its doctrines despite its effects on their followers okay see religion is <clears throat> Uh, what, what the religious in, invokes these these kinds of um uh images um <clears throat> doctrinally driven practices traditional ways scriptural literalism prescriptive expression membership oriented submission to authority guided thinking um sacrificing self sacrificing for the sake of the institution the institution is more important than persons uh doctrine and institution above or more important than persons etc this is the kind of image these are the sort of images conjured up when we mm. say religious you see that is true yeah so if we could say broadly speaking that you no know, religion 
uh, has two, two aspects you know, something like we say what people believe and what people practice so it becomes too dogmatic in terms of beliefs and too ritualistic in terms of practices then people are put yes. off by it yes mm. it's a, that's right yeah so so now, now of course you could say 2000 in, in the 21st century the book came about but the trend itself seems to have started from the 1970s or something where uh, i think that from the counter culture time itself because they people were more interested in eastern spirituality than eastern religion and then it, when this con also started that time also the differentiation between spiritual and religion had started or not any thoughts about that yeah you know um the the you know i mean the, the the struggle between the individual person and the institution has been going on for a very long time and there's always this 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 tension um you know now with the start of christianity um there were these church houses you know there, there were no cathedrals there were no churches there but they had church houses okay. and the okay. apostle paul and the apostle peter and the other apostles would travel around like sannyasins oh okay to the different houses and it's interesting because um paul whose epistles of course are there in the new testament make up much of the new testament we learn from the epistles uh, of paul the apostle paul that he did not favor any church house because they had more people or more money but apparently the other apostles did that's fascinating okay is and that's why Paul never took any money from a, con a congregation and he had his own business he had a tent business he made tents and he sold them and that's how he was supported in going around to each congregation equally without being influenced by famous people or wealthy people or influential people he was willing to take up the austerities of self support and be able to serve his congregants equally okay so that's why i think even now some christian denomination like the amish they don't have church houses that could be one reason of course but that's in, so so are you saying that this danger of Uh, religion becoming ritualistic or externalized that is anticipated right at the dawn of christianity itself that danger yes yes there and, and and again you know humans have a hard time getting along with each other and of course the institution is what really tests that and individuals you know that's that's one thing what an individual can do but what an institution could do is you know can be quite extraordinary I mean look at the cathedrals that have been constructed. I mean Notre Dame in Paris took 700 years. 700 okay. to build. Most people that worked on the building never saw the building completed. Hmm. Now that's an institution. That's not an individual, right? So there are advantages of institutional religion. This is when, you know, people come together to work together. Uh and then but there are also advantages to um to individuals uh really um uh, you know um how should I say um making sure that the spirit of religion is, does not die. uh in institutional kinds of things so for example um uh francis of assisi you know mm -hmm. he was a, a simple catholic monk but he had his own following and they were you know nomadic they were you know they didn't really have a a place so much or a church so much 
and yet the Catholic Church in Rome was so grand and so big and at the time extremely powerful. So you see, there, there's always this tension between the institution and the individual. And I think you need both. I think you need both. I think you need people who will, who will, who will um, strive even beyond institutional norms. And yet you also need the institution so you can bring people together. Beautifully put. Okay. So we could all, so this also, this has almost become like a discussion on the need for institutionalization, whether it is important or not. And that could be an important topic. And we have addressed it briefly also earlier. So overall, what you're saying is that if we consider religion at its core, it was meant to be uh, an expression for the spirit, innate spiritual longing of humanity. But yeah. as it becomes exactly. uh, uh, formalized in some terms, either in terms of certain dogmas or in terms of certain rituals or in, in terms of certain institutional structures, then mm -hmm. there is there is a possibility that it can become too externalized. Although at the same yes. time, all these are also required. So in that sense, we could say religion and uh, the negative connotation of religion is is there because either religion itself has become too externalized or people who are observing religion are focusing too much on its externals and are not perceiving the spiritual essence. It could be both right. ways. Yes. yes. And that's the tension that, that um, individuals may not be um, appreciating and, and supporting the advantages of the institution and the institution may not be appreciating uh, the personalist approach to its its congregants, and um, uh, it's it's it, there's there's it's, we live in a world of duality. You know, this is uh, <laughs> we're always going to go on one side or the other side, and uh, so it's a matter of a very careful you know back and forth balance, and uh, you know we see this in ISKCON as well. You know, we so see the, how are you using the word duality over here? Then we talk okay. about duality in terms of heat and cold or something like that. So yeah, duality here. I'm meaning that there's uh, always the attention of doing too much for the institution or too much for the individual, and and you know to bring a balance between the two that's just right is very hard to achieve. Okay, that makes sense. Duality, a pull from one area to the, uh, you know, a, a kind of pull from one extreme to the other extreme, the, the, the pendulum uh, problem, you know? Okay, that makes sense. So now, you know, this itself could be a big subject to discuss. If we can, should, can we focus on the Gita or you would like to continue discussing yes. from a broader perspective? So, yes, let's focus on the Gita. Yeah. Always wonderful to focus on the Gita. So just my quick thoughts are that the Gita itself deals with issues that are at our, uh, they are centered on the right thing to do and how we can aspire for it. Ultimately, how we, uh, how uh, the longing for love can be channeled to do our, do the right thing in the world. So in one sense, the Gita's message is spiritual. At the same time, it also talks about particular paths. And it also, the sixth chapter mentions about the yoga practices. The nine, ten chapters, nine chapter actually talks about certain bhakti practices. So we can say it is, there are also some religious practices mentioned in the book. Of course, we can say that there's no religious institution mentioned in the book, unless we want to consider the parampara to be an institution. Any thoughts on this? Yes. I mean, one of the, the uh, I mean, and I, I think I've spoken to you about this before in other uh, podcasts, but it bears repeating. The genius of the Gita, unlike the Quran and the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible, the genius of the Gita is it begins with something more universal than a particular theological doctrine. The human condition. Human that speaks universally. 
Hmm. Look, I mean, when you open up the Hebrew Bible and you start with Genesis 1 1, I mean, it's like, wow, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. Beautiful. Sounds like a scripture, right? Um, hmm. uh, the, 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 the arrival of Jesus Christ, you know, Son of God. Uh, he was predicted in the book of Isaiah, blah, 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 and so on, you know. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, Quran, all the all merciful Allah, you know, all compassionate, all merciful Allah. You know, and you know he has uh, given us a, a path to humankind, and um, humankind is to serve him and submit uh, itself to him, and so on. And and you know, so every scripture in the West begins with this allegiance and acknowledgement of the existence of a particular divinity, a particular nomenclature, and so on. The Gita begins. What's going on on the battlefield? Hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, a battlefield. You know, the struggle in human existence, the 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 torment of the human condition, the way we are in conflict within ourselves and outside of ourselves between each other. This is where the Gita begins with the human condition. It's powerful. Later on, it presents the divinity of Krishna. Barely in chapter 4, more in chapter 7 with the I am declarations. And yes. chapter 9 with the I am declarations. And, and you know, uh, you know, yat karoshi, yat ashnasi, yat johoshi, dadati, yat, you know, do whatever you do. Do as an offering to me. Well, that, that, that objective pronoun, me, refers to divinity. But the Bhagavad Gita can be read as great literature. The Bhagavad Gita can be read as a self-improvement book. The Bhagavad can be read as sacred scripture. The Bhagavad Gita can be read as a love call from the divine. Hmm. So it's what we bring. It's what we bring to it, Chaitanya Charanji. You know, what do we bring to a text? Hmm. So there's the world of the text. There's the world in front of the text, the world in which we reside. And there's the world behind the text. Three worlds. The world of the text. Okay. The world in front of the text and the world behind the text. Can you? Well, so, world behind means the world we are bringing in, and the world in front means after we read the text, how we, how it changes our vision of the world. Is that what you're referring to? Not quite. So, the world in front of the text is our encounter of this ancient text and the world of the text. The world of the text is the war, the Kauravas and the Pandavas, they're coming together, you know, Samaveta, Yoyotsavaha, right? They come together desiring uh, to fight, okay? So that's the world of the text. And the world behind the text is seen in verses like in the uh, beginning of chapter 4, you know, where Krishna says to Arjuna, I, have, I know all my, you know, previous, you know, lives you don't know yours you know or I, i'm sorry i know all your previous lives you don't know yours and and so in other words that's the world there's a whole you know world of divinity behind the bhagavad gita but you know so much of that is let in of course in chapter 11 there's a little glimpse of the universal form the virata rupa which is, of course, behind the text. Or even Arjuna wanted to find out, so what, you know, what is behind you? You know, what are you made of? <laughs> you know, so Krishna gives them special eyes to see. So that's the world behind the text. So much about the divine. But the world of the text is what's happening right there in the Gita. The world in front of the text is where we're coming from. We're, we're in the 21st century, as you mentioned. You know, uh, we have we come from different cultures. The Bhagavad Gita has reached pretty much every 
major, even minor culture of the world now. Um, what do we bring to the Gita? So if I'm a spiritual but not religious person, I'm going to look, my world then, is going to interact with the world of the Gita as a book that solves, you know, some modern problems, modern social challenges. Mm. Is that okay? Well, sure, that's okay. Is that the ultimate point of the Gita? No. Is it okay? Yes. That's that's a very good analysis. So that means, you know, there will be a essential message of the Gita which will be universal. At the same time, the Gita will speak to different contexts, and yes. uh, the way it speaks to each context is also important. But the contextual right. application should not be equated with the essential message. That's right. Yes, that's nice. So how exactly are we right. how are we connecting with this this with the topic of a spiritual but not religious you said the gita can be understood at different levels as a say a addressing the human condition as a call for duty as a as a loving exchange mm. yes remember the that south indian brahmana in the chaitanya charitamrita yes who opened the page of the gita and he wept because of this sweet sweet relationship between Arjuna and Krishna. Hmm. And that is the message of the Gita, is the love between divinity and humanity. But we can't all get there yet. You know, so quickly, Chaitanya Charanji, we may, we may need a teacher. We may need to find someone who actually realizes that and is lifted up by that. And then because he or she is lifted up by that, he or she can lift up others into that. Mm. That, is, that is guru. You are lifted up, and then you can lift others up. That is guru. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, so you are saying that ultimately the Gita is meant to raise us towards spiritual consciousness. And with the guru is an important part in that. Is that where you are driving? Absol it? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know what? I, I should relate to you a, a, a little story, Chaitanya Charanji. I should tell you about a conference that I was invited to. Mm. It was a world conference, and this was um, from a group. Uh, without naming them, it was in a Dwayton group, and. The leader uh, is a sannyasin who, at the time, was 85 years old. By now, he must be 91. Hmm. He was sharp as a tack. He had his sannyasin, a few sannyasin disciples there who would also speak. I was one of the keynote speakers because they had found my Bhagavad Gita translation and were very impressed by it. Okay. Okay. So they they asked me to present, and they left it open. Well, I was I, there were places in the audience, right up in the chairs, the the audience in the front. They had my name on the chair, the other names of other speakers, and the speaker, one of the initiates, <clears throat> disciples of this head swami. They placed me next to him because he was to speak next. First, the head swami speaks. This Swami would speak, and then Garuda Das, or they presented me as, you know, Dr. Graham Schweig, okay? Mm. His name, the sannyasa I sat next to, somewhat humorously, is named Nirvisheshananda. Okay. Now, I took that as a very, as Krishna's humor, because I don't know how many times a day I say nirvishesha shunyavadi, paschatyade shatarane. Yeah. Okay. So here I am next to nirvisheshananda Swami, who is going to get up and speak. Now, what? Now, the point of the story is this: 
the head guru got up and said that the Bhagavad Gita is the best book for reducing stress in the modern world. He presented the book as a book that could be consulted to reduce mm -hmm. stress. Then his disciple, Nirvasheshananda, got up and talked about how the Bhagavad Gita could be a very helpful book in the workplace. Okay. At this point, at this point, Chaitanya Charanji, I am feeling totally out of place. I'm about to get up and explain. I'm going to, I think my talk was something like eight universal principles that one could understand from the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the six through eight was drenched in bhakti and, and, and then the, the necessary precondition for whether it be karma, jnana, or even bhakti, there is a necessary precondition for any of these to be valid yogas. And that is divinity's call to us, his love call. And that ultimately his teachings deliver this love call. And it and that yoga is about the divine yoga that Im already embraces us from without, from within, and from everywhere around us. Yoga on our side is about the written embrace. Mm -hmm. Krishna is already embracing us with his Brahman manifestation. That's an embrace. He is already embracing us from within. We are sandwiched in but <laughs> by divinity he's outside he's inside i call that a sandwich he's even got some some uh, 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 uh some some condiment to put on us that's everywhere he's he's everywhere around us in the varatha rupa all we have to do is return the embrace the maha mantra of course is that return embrace mm. you know we have discussed so, all uh, these themes we had a podcast on the universal principles of the gita once and so this that's idea right. of embrace is very beautiful so yeah it's, it's nice so, so what happened was is i i'm giving this presentation and feeling totally out of place because the first two <laughs> presentations were on stress. The Gita talks about how to deal with stress. The second one, how to deal with the, uh, the workplace. And here I am talking about, you know, love of God and love from God. <laughs> there were people in the audience, there were about a thousand people there, easily, probably a little more in this big auditorium. I actually was able to see some of the people in the front area and tears were going down on their cheeks. They were so moved by the presentation that all 100 books that were up in the uh, lobby sold out like this. And the head Swami, that was sort of not really introducing himself to me, he came up to me afterwards. And there are pictures of me with him. And you know, he just thanked me over and over and over for that presentation. So here's the thing. People need to hear things at different levels. People have different needs. You know, mm -hmm. look look at Arjuna. When Arjuna had his breakdown, I mean, he had a major meltdown, as we know. Well, what Krishna teaches at first in the second chapter is different what he teaches toward the end of the 18th chapter, Chaitanya Jaranji. You know this well. Mm. The first thing he, Arjuna needed to hear was, hey, do you know you're eternal? You are eternal. Never was there a time when you did not exist, nor will there ever be a time when all these kings will ever not exist or ever cease to be. And same with myself. We are eternal. We are everlasting forevermore. This is the first teaching. Now, is that the be-all and end-all of the Bhagavad Gita? No. 
but that's what he needed at that time. Then the dialogue progresses, and Krishna saw, now he's ready to hear this. Mm. The, the laws of action. Right? Then he's ready to hear. And then, of course, it's not strictly about karma yoga. It's woven, you know, weaving yoga in, you know, uh, weaving in his own relationship with with Krishna. I mean, with Arjuna, Krishna, weaving in his own relationship with Arjuna. And, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, monolithic. It's a, it's a weave of different things. But each weave has a dominant color. And action, jnana, is that dominant feature in the first several chapters. And then, you know, he's moving now into more and more, you know, Vasudeva Sarvam. Vasudeva Sarvam. Beautiful. How, mm. how beautiful is that? That's... Vasudeva Krishna is everywhere. Mm. Yeah, Krishna Vasudeva that... Krishna is, yeah. is my all. Is my all. What a wonderful mantra. Just that, Chaitanya Charanji. Vasudeva Sarva. You know, that verse also is so beautiful because it brings about like a union of bhakti and jnana. Krishna says the most evolved bhakta is a jnanavan. Bahunam janmanam ante. Jnanavan right. maam prapadyate. And then Vasudeva Sarvamiti. So bhakti is not just sentiment, but it's like what you say. If the universe, the Lord embracing us and we embracing the Lord back is everything. He's That's right. Like, all of existence, through all of existence, he's embracing us. Yes. But the secret here is, as you well know, the secret is that jnana ultimately doesn't become a mere uh, 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 sort of flow of the cognitive faculties. But jnana is also ultimately a faculty of the heart. Okay. Right? This is this is it's it's about then you can know the 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 Shama Sundaram Guna Swarup um uh what is it? Uh Shama Sundaram Guna uh Achintya Guna Swarup. Then you can know what is Achintya. You can then know what is not knowable. Achintya is a future passive participle. This is not knowable, but you can know the unknowable through a special jnana that comes from the heart, not the head. Mm. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. <laughs> it's nice. So, anyway, so in one sense, you know, this itself could be a big subject of discussion. That there yeah. is there is jnana which is an aspect of the intellect and this jnana which comes from the heart. So yes, you know. Yes, in the in the, in the bhakti, you know, the bhakti. Yeah, I was the just going to say the bhakti sutra says that the jnana, the fruits of jnana, the fruits of karma, the fruits of yoga, they are all contained in bhakti. How is that? Because bhakti has to do with the heart. And we know that the jivatman is situated in the heart. The paramatman is situated in the heart. It's about the heart. That's the ultimate knowing, the ultimate acting, and the ultimate uniting. Hmm. Sorry to interrupt. I was no, no, interrupting no. you. No, this is not yeah. beautiful. So again, if we bring this all back to our topic of uh, religious and spiritual, if I understand right, what you are saying is that the Gita has a core message that is very strongly spiritual, that is channeling the human heart's longing for eternity. So in one yes. sense, by telling that at our core, we are eternal and there is an object for our love that is also eternal. So the yes. central core is, is at one sense spiritual of the Gita. Yes. I mean, take a bird. Take a bird, a, long, a, a birdling, a little, a little baby bird in a nest. Hmm. That bird just needs to learn how to just deal within the nest. I mean, that you know, that's the first kshetra, the first sphere. It's a very narrow sphere. The child, right? The bird. 
And then the bird can go beyond the nest. And it may flop around a little bit, but then it has to learn how to use its wings to fly from the nest but only maybe very limitedly, only maybe to the next branch and then fly back. Mm. And then eventually the bird can really know how to fly way beyond its place of origin, its original condition. So the Gita can nourish the baby bird, the bird that's growing up, and the bird that's maturing and the ultimate flight. So, you know, these are expansions of the, our kshetras, our sphere of awareness. What is our frame of reference? Our frame of reference is the, the kshetra. We are all kshetra gyas, right? This is right out of the 13th chapter of the Gita, right? 13th, 14th chapters, right? The mm, kshetra yeah. gya, 13th chapter mainly, right? 13th, kshetra, yeah. right? Kshetragya, the knower of the field. But that knowing, Chaitanya Charanji, is not merely cognitive. It's the way things feel. It's a sensing of what is in our, in our realm, our sphere, our worlds. That's the world in front of the text. Mm, that's beautiful. In front of the text, yeah. That's the world in front of the text. Why is Krishna explaining this after the 12th chapter where he's talking about these beautiful levels of offering the heart and how much he dearly loves the soul that relates to him at all kinds of levels? Mm. So there are different levels of loving Krishna, and he loves them all, remember? And then he explains how this is, how these different levels are. Well, we have these different kshetras. Mm. So, I'm again trying to connect this, this, you know, the concept of kshetra and kshetra itself is a fascinating concept. So, are you trying to say that depending on the kshetra of a person, they will also pursue the Gita accordingly. That means somebody will pursue it as a spiritual book. Somebody will see it as a religious book. Or how, how is the Shetra concept connected with our discussion? Exactly. Exactly. If, if um, we are not ready to fly much beyond the nest, if we're still very conditioned by our individual nests, which is our immediate conditioning, then the Gita will, can, can nourish one there, that way. Now, what's interesting is that when someone has found this ability to be nourished beyond the nest and, and has found a, 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 a teacher to, to bring it, to lift us up to levels of liberation, but then sort of backtrack a little bit, possibly, because in the process of learning how to fly so high, one can feel the resistances that one is still yet carrying from the conditioning that we've had. So then one may go to not the Bhagavad Gita anymore, but one may go to some self-help books. Okay. Because you see, when the Gita is treated as a self-help book, then one may say, well, that's good enough for me, for the Gita. Let me go to another self-help book. There are even some self-help uh, gurus out there who have actually utilized the Bhagavad Gita in their self-help methods. So just sorry, sorry to come back to this point that uh, I'm just trying to understand. So quite often spirituality is associated with also with self-help. So is that the <laughs> that's right with the, with the spiritual but not religious? So That's right. So earlier when you were giving uh, the example of you being at the conference, so the other speakers were speaking, you could say at a lower level where they are, the world in front of the text, they were addressing that. Whereas you That's were right. addressing more the text itself, but of course still presenting it in a way that was up, up relevant and appealing. Exactly. <clears throat> so I was trying my, to connect those two worlds, the world of the text 
Well, they were also connecting it, but not the ultimate message of the text. They were they were uh, trying to connect <clears throat> some of the basic tools. You know, many many scholars even think <clears throat> that the Gita's ultimate teaching is Palatyaga. Mm. I think that's the all in all teaching of the Gita, Palatyaga. Yeah. What? It's, what? <laughs> I mean, the Gita does so much more than Palatyaga. Or they don't understand the essence of Palatyaga. When one is in love with the divine, of course, the Tyaga, the relinquishment of anything else is easy. It's natural. But they will look at Palatyaga as something that you have to practice. Hmm. You know, it's a difference between a bicycle. Have you ever seen those bicycles that you, you bicycle in place, right? Yeah. So you have the benefit of, of strengthening your body, but you don't get anywhere. Hmm. <laughs> you, you take the bike off the stand and do the same cycling, and then you go somewhere. Hmm. Some people reading the Gita don't necessarily want to go anywhere, but they want to strengthen where they are. That's beautifully put. You know, sometimes I put it this way that, like, sometimes people want the Gita to simply be like a shock absorber for the journey of life where they want to go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's very similar. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So, but then we can say that the Gita is not just like a shock absorber although it can be that but it is all it is more like a you could say a gold transformer it gives a higher vision yeah. a high, higher purpose yeah. for life right very good yeah very good thank you and you know it's not that i'm putting these things down and nor are you chaitanya Chakraji. Yeah, of course. i know you well is we can appreciate that people have different points of access hmm and honestly, Chaitanya Sharanji, even though I've been studying the Bhagavad Gita for 55 years, reading the Gita for 55 years, each of those, you know, decades, and decade and a half at one point, I guess, I have reached different depths of the Gita. And even though I think, and each time I think I've reached the ultimate depth for me, I still reach some greater depth that I could never have anticipated. And that's what's exciting about spiritual life. Hmm. So, so rather than, so if I come back to a topic of spiritual, but not religious, we can say that the Gita is definitely a spiritual book and even spiritual in the many different meanings of the word. So if somebody thinks of spiritual as self-help, it is there. If somebody thinks of spiritual as the ultimate expression of love, that is also there. Yes. Spiritual as the, as the aspiration of the human spirit for something higher, that is also there. Yes. So now, uh, if we come back to the religious part, the, in more you can say in a descriptive sense, yeah. So, is the Gita a religious book in terms of uh, the way the word religion is understood today? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to discuss something more about Yes, that, no, that. maybe, you know. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, you, you know, I, I, what I, I like, you know, I remember living in India. Hmm. And this is where the, you know, the kind of uh, acha, you know, motion of the head, you know, acha, right? <laughs> okay, yes. I learned, I said, you know, in the West, we're very binary. You know, something is yes or no. Hmm. It's black or white. But this head wobble, you know, acha, right, is beautiful. Because the head wobble says yes, it says no, it says maybe, maybe not, all of the above, and none of the above. Mm -hmm. all at the same time 
And that, that drives, you know, Westerners crazy. You know, we like a black and white answer. So, of course, the Gita is a spiritual book. It is a religious book. It is also a book of great literature. It has great literary value. It is a classic for the human race. It is a, uh, it will remain forever a classic piece of literature for the human race. Um, and it is a self-help book for those who need that. Yeah, it's all of those. It's multivalent in what it can address. Okay. So let's put it in a little more specific if I'll try to ask the question. So yes. could we call the Gita a secular book? In the sense that see, in India, in the West, secular is often used as an opposite of religious or spiritual. In India, of course, that same connotation is there, but secular is used also in the sense of, um, you could say neutral toward religion, although it is applied in different ways. So could we call the Gita a secular book in any sense? I mean, if it is various things for various people, but does it go far enough to say that it's also a secular book without uh, without denying or downplaying its its core message? I think you you know you can't call the Bhagavad Gita anything other than the song of the divine, and all that that can include, which is you know it uh, uh, it it has enormous. Uh, 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 potential to contribute to secular issues and and humanistic issues. I mean, it's a book of psychology, for heaven's sake. We haven't even mentioned psychology. It's an amazing book of psychology. In fact, the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna is like a therapist to a patient. In fact, it may be the first Counsel, recorded counseling session in the history of the human race. Okay. I mean, we've got an open therapy session going on here between you know, Arjuna, who has a major breakdown. I mean, he literally has an emotional breakdown. He collapses. He. This is not just a light depression of some kind. Hmm. This is a state of despair and hopelessness. This is counseling. This is a psychological process. It also says it also makes an enormous statement about interpersonal dealings and loving relationships. The Gita is is a a, a colossal uh, uh, and multi layered rich text from which practically any human could draw some meaning. So I refuse to call it a secular text or a religious text mm. you know, or, a, you know, a self-improvement text because it's it can accommodate all of these. Mm. So do you yeah, accept I, my refusal? Yeah, yeah. No, no, do I, you I, accept I, my I, refusal? I just, no, 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 I accept it. I'm just trying to re-articulate it. So you're saying that... <laughs> We, we could even even derive some secular wisdom from the Gita, but that is yes. different from calling the Gita a secular book. That's right. Okay. There you go. That's so, as far as I'm willing to go. Okay. Yeah, I mean, makes sense. You, I think, you, you know, yeah. call the Gita a self-help book is, yeah, it it is much more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for each individual, it, it, it may not be more than that at that time. And that is fine. That maybe. And that is fine. That is their frame of reference. Hmm. So now coming to the Indian context a little bit, yes. we could say that uh, in India, the Gita has is considered one of the most important texts for the broad Hindu tradition. Although it is, from what I've seen historically, just like the Bible and the Quran, where central texts for uh, for Christianity and Islam, the Hindu tradition didn't have like one defining text. But to some extent, the Gita has 
taken that position at least yes. uh, in recent history maybe you could say the pre independence times the last 200 300 years so yes. so in that sense from uh, so is the gita if you want to put it specifically can we call the gita a hindu book how would you put it that way or hmm. well of course now yes it certainly gained more more importance in, over the past few hundred years but it's always been important in terms of uh within the hindu complex it is one of three prastana trayi Mm. that is to say the foundational text so if one wants to start a school of thought or an or religious practice or both one has to write commentary on the principal upanishads um the vedanta sutra and of course bhagavad gita those are the three of the prastana trayi so so the, so this of course um a Roma, uh, uh, shankara charya um, the first Vedantist, really, uh, he wrote on all three. Um, I read his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita and also the Shariraka Mimangsabhasya of the uh, Vedanta Sutra, Brahma Sutras. Um, um, you know, and, and then there's the Upanishad. So, um, so Ramanuja in the Vaishnava line, you know, he was the first one to write a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedanta Sutra and the Upanishads. And each of the major Acharyas would do this, you know. This is what they do. So uh, just to it, just to clarify this, you know, even within yes. the what we call as Hinduism or what or the broad Vedic tradition, yes. the six schools of philosophy and the Prasthantra is considered important for one of the six schools, Vedanta. Uh, from what I know from Nyaya and Vaisheshika and Yoga, they didn't consider the Prasthantra as their three core books. And in that sense, for them, the Gita was also not unimportant, but it was not of central importance. Am I right, right in that understanding? That's right. That's right. There's a shifting of what are the most prominent and important texts, depending upon the particular tradition within the Hindu complex. Um, that is right. Um, but if you're a Vedantic, if you are Vedantic, you have to write about the Upanishads, you have to write on the, the Brahma Sutra, and you have to write about Gita, Gita Upanishad. It's often uh, taken on the status of an Upanishad. So it's often, as you know, it's often referred to as Gita Upanishad. Yes. True. Which is Shruti, Shruti. See, by saying Gita Upanishad, you're saying Bhagavad Gita is not merely Smriti, but it is Shruti. Hmm. And Vedanta Sutra is the interpretation, it's the distillation of the interpretation of the Shruti. Okay. And the Bhagavad Gita, as you said, I mean, the reason why it's often called the Bible of Hinduism, which is a little, it can be, that can be a little um, misleading, but it's certainly that one text to which more commentaries have been written than any other single text yes, in, in is Hindu true. history. I think it's something like 88 or 90 commentaries, formal commentaries, and probably more than that informally and so on mm. it's powerful yeah. now you know when gandhi came along gandhi needed to see the gita as a kind of inner struggle that is true. he didn't want to see it and, you know for his purposes that was for him the truth he derived from the gita mm. and that's fine but is that the complete gita well no but that's fine it's he what he did with it was powerful and it aided him he read from it every day and then you've got henry david thoreau <laughs> you know over yeah. in the north in, you know he read from the bhagavad gita uh while he's out camping out at in walden pond for two years two months and two days hmm 
Okay. <laughs> and then you've got, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a professor at Harvard University, right? Who read incessantly from the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. They each take from it something, some jewel, you know, something valuable. You know? Hmm. That's true. So, so the way you are answering this is that if different people and from different areas can draw some wisdom, so even within the Indian national context, also some wisdom can be drawn from the Gita. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if somebody has an objection, so there are two with respect to at least the world in the Indian context, there are some people who would like to have the Gita taught as a matter of national religious pride. It is India is prominently Hindu country, probably the only Hindu majority country in the world. There are Bhutan and Nepal, but they have become increasingly commun uh, under the influence of, of China. They're becoming more mm. and more left wing. So then one, one would like to have the Gita taught as a Hindu book. Mm. And there is other group who will say that, no, this is a Hindu book. And that's why India is a secular country. You cannot teach it over here. So, mm -hmm. so in that context, uh, which dimensions of the Gita or which teachings of the Gita could be integrated into, say, mainstream education in a way that is at one level, at least some level, faithful to the Gita, at the same time, respectful to the uh, secular spirit of the uh, mainstream society today? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, this is where one can take the Bhagavad Gita and give a kind of allegorical interpretation to the Gita. Now, is that respectful to the original intent of the Gita? Mm, uh, not so much, um, you know, but, but look, uh, you know, if, if that's the only way they can accept the Gita into their curriculum, then I say, why not? Hmm. You know, so in, I mean, once, uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, I mean, Jenna yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, part of me, you know, you know, one side of me. Um, if you like that side of me, you might want to get to know another side of me. Hmm. But right now, you're not ready to. Okay. I just like Garuda on the podcast, I don't want to sit down and take prasadam with them, you know. Okay. You know? So. So, whatever. but later you might say, you know what? I would like next time I'm 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 on the east coast of of, of America. Maybe I will like to sit down uh, with Karuna and and take prasadam with him, right? So then you're going to get to know Karuna more on this side, a more personal side. So you know, formally you may accept a person, one side of that person, but is that the whole person? Hardly. So the key does. Mm. Is like that. So we may approach the Gita at first more superficially. Then we get like like we would with anyone. We get to, you know, we get to know them more, and then we can go deeper. But then we may stop. Hey, that's enough. It's nice knowing Garuda on the podcast, maybe occasional persona, but that's it. I don't want to meet his kids, you know, you know, I don't want to meet his grandmother. Which you wouldn't be able to because she's passed away but you know okay. whatever but that's, you know, that's, anyway. that's interesting so in one sense we could almost apply like uh, in the bhakti we say that yena kena prakarina mana krishna niveshet. somehow or other fix the mind on krishna so similarly yeah. we could say that somehow or other connect with the gita and that's right so at least that basic introduction comes in and then yes. gradually uh, some some people will get uh, some people will become more, uh, uh, in, well, at least it will be somewhere in the background of their consciousness and maybe at the right time they will explore further. Yes. You know, sometimes when I speak to like general Indian college audiences, sometimes I am dismayed at the level of unawareness of India's spiritual tradition. Like if I quote from the Bhagavad Gita mm. and then I quote from the Bhagavatam, one of the most yeah. common questions is, what is the difference between the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam? <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. That's, hey, hey, you got to start somewhere, right? 
yeah of course you know i i feel dismayed but then i think back at it in although i grew up in india in a brahmin family i had heard about the bhagavad gita i had heard about the rama and mahabharat and i had heard many of the stories from the bhagavatam but actually i had yes. never heard about the bhagavatam ah there you go which is interesting there you go so but, yeah and not just interesting it's disappointing you can say also but yes the point is that so somewhere we have to start mm-hmm. yes so when you say the allegorical uh can you give some some further elaboration of what you mean by some allegorical meaning okay so so for example i mean clearly krishna presents himself as the divine yes i mean you know i mean there are many many verses revealing this declaring it extolling it etc hmm okay but if that's that that theological dimension is not compatible with secular purposes then one can simply say reality this that krishna is the voice of reality and uh you don't have to say god you don't have to say bhagavan despite the fact that the book is known by the title bhagavat gita right hmm. um but you can you can in other words you can kind of dilute the theological dimension of it and secularize it more you know by by you know krishna is the same this is the voice of all existence this is the voice of in some sense reality at at its complete level or something like that so you can kind of um translate you know or uh, um you, you know this 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 is the nature of reality speaking to us mm. you know you, you can de theologize you can de theologize krishna because you have a need for a secular context which doesn't really allow for a serious theological reading of the gita okay it sounds cr- it sounds cruel to the work itself but you know what hmm. the gita is strong enough to handle it but just out of curiosity do you know if something similar has been done with respect to the bible or something like that i know many with respect to the quran probably there are many countries which are like openly islamist so they can teach the quran directly but much of the western world where christianity is in a majority is secular yeah so is the bible ta- taught in any of the christian majority countries and how is it taught any idea about this okay so the world in front of the text for a 19th to 20th century early 20th century theologian in Germany by the name of Rudolf Bultmann I happened to study with a student of Rudolf Bultmann at Harvard okay but his teacher Rudolf Bultmann engaged in a process called demythologization okay he went through the new testament and he said what would the new testament messages be if you took out all of the miraculous stuff so in other words we're living in an age of science we know that you cannot walk on water hmm. i mean chaitanya charan is magical a person as you clearly are can you walk on water true that makes sense yeah. you cannot do Okay so you okay we've established that you cannot walk on water and neither can I and we've never met anyone who can walk on water Jesus is said to have walked on water hmm is that necessary for the message of the of the new testament Rudolf Bultmann comes along with his demythologization process and says no it is not necessary so he takes that out the fish that that feeds 40 you know 40 people he, he takes one fish and is able to to make meals of for 40 people right um and um and and uh, or something like that anyway all of the he's he comes to the conclusion and say that says that the teachings of the new testament are not harmed 
by removing those things, by demythologizing the New Testament, and then we get its essential message. Hmm. So there could be a way, you might say, to de-theologize, to de-theologize the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, it's interesting. You're using the word specifically de-theologize. We can't, <laughs> yeah. de we can't de-spiritualize because spirituality is the, at a very basic level, the essence of the Gita. You know, if you... If you despiritualize it, I mean, you're boiling it down to a kind of a conversation of friends who just have a problem in the middle of the battlefield. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, I mean, but that itself is kind of a, it's an it's a great narrative. You know, Arjuna freaks out in the battlefield. I mean, that itself is 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 quite a narrative. You could secularize that. You know. Hmm. That's interesting. But then, so I think that means we'll have to be sensitive with respect to the context and then decide what level of the teaching of the Gita would be acceptable for a particular audience. Yes. And that's always a little difficult because, you know, an audience has many people in it and each person has their own kshetra. But kshetras are also heavily shaped by the culture, the environs, hmm. the, 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 the sort of dominant culture within that environs. So, um, so one can kind of generally assess the world in front of the text that you are addressing in relation to the Gita. So how to bring the, their world that's in front of the text to the world of the text. Mm. That is your task as a lecturer and teacher of the Gita. Beautiful. So we now just to elaborate this in a couple of points. Like Prabhupada says in the Gita introduction that Jiva, Ishwara, Kala, Karma, Prakriti. These are the five yes. essential themes of the Gita. That's right. Now from Madhva. It's from Madhva. Madhva, okay. Uh, yeah. now in one sense, uh, in, if I look at exactly how many verses talk about each of these, in yeah, the, is that like we can talk about karma yoga, bhakti yoga to be the core messages. Yoga is a very important part of the Gita's teachings. Yes. So, so, so is this is this the only approach? It means these are the five essential themes of the Gita. Is this like a non-negotiable truth or that is, these are five essential elements from one perspective of studying the Gita? Um, there are, um, there are specifically Madhva categories. Okay. Who wanted to talk about the five eternal truths of the Gita, right? Wait a minute. I think four are eternal. One is not, right? Um, uh, do I have that right? Um, yeah, karma is not eternal. Remaining four are eternal. Yes. Right. Okay. So there you go. Okay. So, and and so th this is uh, a Madhva, you know, observation, his philosophical observation of what's happening in the Gita. But that's one way to slice it. There are many ways to, let me put it this way, there are many facets of a jewel. Okay. So you want to, you know, to really appreciate a jewel, you have to, you have to turn the, the thing and let all the facets catch the light as much as possible. At the same time, you could focus on just one facet. Stop turning the jewel and just like, oh, let it shine just at that level. But then if you're ready to turn it, you'll see other facets. So... These uh, categories of mantra perfectly valid, um, but there are other ways to have this jewel of the Gita shine through other facets. Okay. So, are there? So, the, why I brought these five things is if we are going to look at the Gita from a particular perspective, are there some aspects of the Gita that are non negotiable? So we could, like one said, they could de-theologize the Gita. That means Krishna and Bhakti to Krishna, some people might see it as sectarian. 
so uh, so that might be downplayed uh, and the idea of karma and karma yoga and equanimity detachment steadiness those are virtues which can be appreciated by almost by everyone in one sense so karma can be we could say is universal even to the to some extent jiva although not everybody may accept that there is a soul but the concept is not as objectionable as say god for many people so and then kala yeah. and prakriti i'm not sure whether we can elaborately speak on those topics uh, as core teachings of the gita but uh, so so my point is that when we are presenting the gita to a specific audience is there anything this is non negotiable and this has to be presented or whatever aspect of the gita those or that audience can relate with we can only present that much and let them explore further you know um that's a really good question and it's it's um it's complex it's 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 complicated because you know in certain contexts there are certain things that are non-negotiable that you cannot really ignore but in other contexts you can ignore them hmm. ultimately ultimately how does the text itself want to be understood and we we have talked about this ajitan acharyji and you've also read my textual illuminations in my bhagavad gita um in fact that's when we first met i you proved to me that you read the book and i rarely hear <laughs> that, that someone's really read read the book carefully but you understood what my presentation was saying which was claiming that the ultimate message of the gita is a divine longing for souls to come to the divine this this is at the heart of the whole gita it's the reason why krishna generously presents teachings on karma on yoga on jnana on bhakti but behind all of those beyond the polemics of arguing which is more important in the gita karma or jnana jnana or bhakti or behind all those polemics all those polemics are ridiculous because there is a necessary precondition for any of those things to be activated and that is the divine longing the divine love call Beautiful. krishna says the, the the in his last words to arjuna he presents a rhetorical question in 1872 have you heard this whole teaching with thought focused on the single highest point ekagra ekagra eka agra the summit the single highest have you heard all of these teachings with thought focused on the single highest point what is that single highest point as you know it's in 1864 sarva goyatam bhuya shrinu me paramang bacha ishto si me dritam itti tato vachami te atam beautiful the greatest secret of all my supreme message you are so much loved by me that is behind the whole thing now anything that comes short of that Well, you know, Chaitanya Charanji, I used to read the Gita without realizing that that was behind everything. Sorry, come again. I used to. I used to read the Gita without realizing that single highest point, that ekagra, that sarva goyatam ambuya, you know, that istosi me dritamiti. I, the the yoga uh, 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 guhyam param yoga the supreme secret of yoga what is that it's this divine longing and then we can act and we can think and contemplate we can meditate and we can love with our hearts the divine all of that is offered to the divine all of that is in response to a divine longing and to a divine embrace hmm. and that is one of the most beautiful teachings of the gita that love is an embrace 
in an embrace, we express two things, a total acceptance of the other and yet a, a desire to more deeply know the beloved. So one embraces the beloved in a, in a realm, in a, in a mood of total acceptance, but yet total insatiability at the same time. The more dimension that we started about in, in our talk today, the more, I want more, I want to know you more. Hmm. This is love, this is love. And Krishna demonstrates that to us in the Gita. That's beautiful. So, so, okay. So, if I just bring back to the subject, what you're saying yes. is that that different people may come to that ekagra level at different times. So, if yes. somehow, where whichever point they connect with, if gradually by that, that thirst comes, and they keep rising, rising higher, till they come. That's to it. The they keep continue. climbing that mountain. Yes. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then, I'm thinking of this mountain metaphor. So let's, uh, you know, let's get people to at least become aware that there is this wonderful mountain with beautiful view from the top and everything. And then whichever part of the mountain they find ac appealing, accessible, that is what we can present to them. Yes. The 18th chapter is the mountain. The first 49 verses okay. is the great secret addressing karma, the outer world. The next 14 verses, the middle of the mountain, is the greater secret. Guyatara, okay? Guya is first. Guyatara, second, has to do with Brahman and Paramatman, this realm of greater transcendence and purity of self. And then the tip of the mountain, the Ekagra, is only three verses. So 49, 14, and 3. Okay. You see, there's the mountain. And three so the, the greater, pro, so the greater these... preponderance of, of the mountain is, is all this stuff that can be used in secular ways. Hmm. About dharma, karma, jnana. These are all, you know, it could be 49 verses of the 18th chapter, which summarize the teachings. And then you've got the 14 about transcendence and Paramatman and Brahman. And then three, three verses. Mm. Come to me, for you are dearly loved by me. 1865, right? Relinquish. Now you can relinquish all forms of dharma. At the bottom of the mountain, I'm talking to you about dharma all over the place. Now, at this stage, what matter does dharma have? Mm. At this stage of love, what does what what does what meaning does dharma have at that point? He's not saying to relinquish it everywhere. He's saying at that level of the mountain, you relinquish dharma. But you can't have the tip without having the bottom of the mountain. No tip of a mountain is floating in the air, Chaitanya Charanji. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to have the middle and you have to have the base. But at that level, when you've reached the peak of that mountain, I'm sure mountain climbers have this feeling like, wow. Nothing else matters. <laughs> you know, this kind of height that's been reached. Um, mm. This is the Gita. This is the Gita. It's beautiful. And uh, so, this is amazing. Just one last point here before we, yes. uh, and we had, we had tried to, yes. to keep it a little shorter this time. Yes. Mm. So, no, Prabhu, maybe this will sell you a big discussion. Sometimes Prabhupada says that if we are not talking about Krishna in the Gita, then that is an offense to the Gita because Krishna is the essence of the Gita. So, yes. so 
is so is it that prabhupad is uh, uh, talking more about somebody removing krishna from the gita he is not really opposing if somebody takes a part of the gita and presents it but if somebody is saying that this is the gita and then they are removing krishna from it is that what he is saying or uh, because we are talking about yeah. like, taking one aspect of the gita and presenting it that's why i thought yes. to discuss this yes you know you and i as authors and writers and teachers i mean you and i know what it's like to be quoted and not credited beautifully put yeah i mean a very prominent wonderful vaishnavi has written a book wonderful book she takes an idea of mine that she never could have thought herself hmm. and she puts it in the book and she doesn't she doesn't credit me fine but you know what it's more powerful if she had credited me because i know sanskrit and she doesn't hmm. so it validates it more and it also acknowledges her relationship with me by removing that credit she's ignored her relationship with me and she stated something that she could not have stated without me so it it's it there is something a bit violating in that i mean violating maybe that's a bit strong you are dismissive you are dismissing the source and the authority from which that idea came so mm -hmm. you're ultimately weakening yourself perhaps with the intention of giving the impression that this is something i came up with so it's it's not exactly stealing you know it's not exactly plagiarizing but it's not the right thing to do okay oh so you are con connecting that with if somebody krishna being removed yeah Okay. removing krishna from his own ideas and his own words that never feels good to anyone including divinity okay now there are three aspects to this this one is like krishna is the source of the wisdom then krishna is the you could say the purpose of the wisdom because the krishna is both vedaishya sarvai rahamay vedya ultimately the gita says surrender to me and, that's right and then we could also have krishna as the i don't know i mean the essence of the wisdom essence and purpose yes. are similar but uh, there is a difference between the two in one sense so i don't think anybody is going to remove krishna as the source of course some people yeah. may do that krishna himself like prabhu i think in the sometimes people say uh, who spoke the gita doesn't matter we are concerned only with the wisdom that is in the gita that is right. quite objectionable so you are saying that prabhu pad is strongly concerned about that that yes. somebody just removes krishna makes krishna himself irrelevant and then focuses on the wisdom but That's right. krishna is the essence or krishna is the purpose that need not yeah. come in the first presentation of the gita that's right okay that's that's beautiful yeah makes sense yeah hmm. so so when you are talking about detheologizing it is not like a copyright violation because we are still acknowledge that this is the wisdom <laughs> spoken by krishna yeah. but we are just not that's focusing right. on the krishna is the purpose of the gita right okay makes sense so this yeah, is a, yeah this is a very good framework for me so should yeah. i try to summarize a little bit overall please okay so we today we discussed is the gita a religious or a spiritual book it started by how religion itself is uh origin it comes from the ligare which means to connect and humans have a longing for something more beyond the normal and that may be expressed to extreme sports through movies through various things and ultimately it's expressed through spirituality to go beyond the normal so religion yes. ultim essentially was meant to direct that human search toward the transcendental mm -hmm. but when religion gets when religion is seen negatively we talk about the prescriptive and descriptive meanings of the words in religion is seen negatively it is often because 
it is it sometimes becomes too dogmatic it sometimes becomes too ritualistic too institutionalized you mentioned how even at the dawn of christianity paul did not talk about organized church house church yeah, church structures so when that happens then it can become a problem and that's mm. when people start feeling i don't want to be religious i want to be spiritual so right then we discussed about with respect to the gita is it religious or is it spiritual so in one sense we discussed many different meanings of the word spiritual if we consider the human condition and how to address the challenges that confront the human condition which is what the gita begins with and which is what often people think of as spirituality then definitely the gita addresses that the gita contains self help wisdom which is also one and and one dimension of spirituality the gita also talks about our essential spiritual identity talks about our longing for love being fulfilled through the embrace with the divine so these are also we could say core spiritual concepts so in that mm. sense the gita does gita is a spiritual book very much and depending on the kshetra the level of consciousness the perspective which a person is approaching they may take yes. particular dimensions from particular things from the gita and yes that is acceptable because at least they are getting connected with the gita so then we discussed about of course there many other points also we came in this came along but with respect to is the gita a religious book well yes you could say that in the west it is often binary yes or no but it is yes no maybe all of those could apply over here <laughs> <laughs> so if we take the opposite question is the gita a secular book well secular wisdom can be drawn from it but to to apply any label apart from bhagavad gita the song of god to the gita would be like reducing the gita so yeah. in that sense <clears throat> the gita is a central book within what is now called the hindu tradition and it has been for several centuries so of course different even hindu thinkers drew out different aspects of the gita so some focused yeah. on making it allegorical some focused on nishkam karma and other things like that so with respect to the gita itself if some if for teaching in particular contexts like if the gita needs to be detheologized like then the demythologizing the mythologizing of the gita, the bible was done so detheologizing can be done so that is just so that people can accept at their level and then they can learn more as and when they feel eager to learn at least that curious yes. that awareness is coming and then further ex- curiosity is up to them so now when prabhupad talks about uh, misinterpreting the gita he is more talking about denying krishna as the source of the gita that itself yes. is that is itself quite objectionable that's like taking the idea from a an author and not attributing it to the author but uh, overall it's important that we understand so there is the three concepts of you know the world before the text the world of the text and the world after the text was it before and yeah. after yeah behind. behind behind and in front behind and in front so it is in one sense uh, for each uh, generation or each uh, each generation of teachers to actually understand the world that they are encountering and then present the relevant teachings on the gita for that world and that way create curiosity for people to explore the core teachings also so so yes. in that sense the gita has everything has a wisdom for everyone and if there is opportunity to teach it, teach it in mainstream education then that has that can be expertly utilized so that mm-hmm. we don't put off uh, so uh, so we can address secular concerns at the same time give access to the spiritual wisdom of the gita and rather than saying that any particular aspect of the gita is non negotiable you know it yeah. depends on the context there are different frameworks from which different elements may be considered central but rather than focusing on what is non negotiable we can focus on what is accessible and get people towards the core message gradually yes okay. beautiful thank you anything else you would like to add prabhu this is amazing discussion thank you i very always very enjoy much. our discussions chetan charanji always to, always enjoy So thank I you thank so you for the opportunity. I thank you for the opportunity. And my thanks to you. It's always so stimulating having the discussion with you. Hare Krishna Guru. Jai.
Hare Krishna.